In previous uh, lectures, we've talked about the expansion of democracy. We've talked about what democracy is. We've looked at legitimacy, democratic consolidation, and political culture, the attitudes and values toward democracy. Uh, the question, of course, arises, where does a democratic culture come from? What shapes attitudes and values toward democracy that are favorable to developing and sustaining democracy? And we saw that this can potentially arise uh, as a result of national experience. I suggested that Africans have been through uh, bitter disappointments in terms of autocratic and unaccountable rule, and this has helped to uh, drive them toward a firm uh, and resilient embrace of democracy in general and the specific institutions of democracy. But there's a powerful theory out there that uh, social factors and economic factors may also shape uh, attitudes and values toward democracy and other conditions that help to encourage and sustain democracy. And one of the social and economic factors that's most overarching and most powerful uh, in the theoretical literature as a candidate for causation of democracy and for at least the sustaining of democracy is economic development. The original modern thesis of this uh, in the last, say, several decades of comparative social science work was articulated by Seymour Martin Lipset, first in his famous 1959 article, Some Social Requisites of Democracy, and then in Political Man, uh, which was published the following year in 1960 and revised and republished again uh, in, uh, I believe, 1981. Lipset wrote in 1959 in that famous article, perhaps the most common generalization linking political systems to other aspects of society is related to the state of economic development. The more well-to-do a nation, the greater the chances that it will sustain democracy. Now, he uh, derived uh, this argument, or at least found evidence in support of it, by looking at the distribution of political systems uh, in two kind of cultural sets of countries. First, the European states of Western Europe and the English-speaking world, uh, including North America, Australia, New Zealand, and then Latin America. And he decomposed those two cultural zones uh, into two groups for Europe and the English-speaking world, stable democracies and then unstable democracies and dictatorships. For Latin America, a rather different grouping, uh, stable dictatorships and then democracies and regimes that were moving back and forth between dictatorship uh, and democracy. And what he found uh, in this article that was quite striking is that within each cultural zone, the uh, more democratic group of countries were the ones that had higher levels of economic development on a number of dimensions like uh, per capita income. What do we learn now about um, the relationship between development and democracy uh, from uh, contemporary evidence? Well, as I'm going to suggest, we can look at the Human Development Index, a broader measure of development than just per capita income. And there we see that if we look at the 25 most developed countries, setting aside Hong Kong, which is not an independent country, of the top 25, Singapore is the only one that's uh, among the 25 best in human development and that is not a democracy. If we look at the top 40 countries in human development, as measured by the United Nations Development Program for the most recent year available, uh, 2011, we see that there are a few other exceptions in the top 40, Brunei, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates, but they're all oil-rich states, and oil-rich states with very small populations. Moreover, among the uh, democracies in this group 
of high human development, whether you look at the top 25 or the top 40, all of the highly developed countries that are democracies are not just democracies, they're liberal democracies. So there does seem to be something about development that is promoting uh, resilient and liberal democracy uh, and makes it highly likely among the most developed countries. Now, what if we put human development aside uh, and just look at economic uh, development in dollar terms, per capita income? Uh, and we'll look at this for now and later on in terms of purchasing power parity dollars that is controlling for fluctuations in exchange rates, uh, trying to look at a basket of goods and say, what can a dollar buy in one country versus another uh, so that we're looking at the same real level of uh, dollar income across states. Of the 30 richest countries in per capita income uh, in 2011, we find six authoritarian states. Uh, Singapore again, but then now five uh, uh, Persian Gulf uh, Arab uh, oil-rich states. Qatar, United Arab Emirates, uh, well, one that's not in the Gulf, Brunei, Kuwait, and Bahrain. So Singapore and five small oil-rich states. About 23 countries derive more than 60% of their export earnings from oil and gas exports. That is, they're oil dependent in terms of their economic uh, vitality. Twelve of these are in the Middle East, seven are in Africa, and then you have four others, Russia, Azerbaijan, again Brunei, which is a sultanate in Southeast Asia, and Venezuela. What is striking about these uh, 23 states, as I noted in my book, The Spirit of Democracy, is that none of them are an electoral democracy. And where electoral democracy came uh, into being or you know, was restored uh, in Russia and Nigeria uh, or where it had existed in Venezuela, it was crushed in each of these countries under the weight of the perversities of politics and governance that are induced uh, by the massive inflow of oil rents. I don't have time in this lecture to go into depth on why oil and democracy don't mix, but I can note briefly some important factors that have discussed in the, been discussed in the literature that I do think um, have a, a very important causal influence. First of all, when a country depends on oil rents for its uh, income, and when a government depends on uh, the, this windfall of oil income, it severs or profoundly distorts relations of citizenship, of citizens feeling like they're the boss and the government is accountable to them. The government is taking their tax revenue and has to account for how it spends it. Well, in an oil-rich country, the government isn't taking much in the way of tax revenue from the citizens. And so the attitude is it's the money of those who rule. They'll spend it as they want. Citizens are alienated and detached um, because it's not their money in a way that the government is sp uh, 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 spending. It's this windfall that's gushing up from the ground uh, as oil revenue. And this creates states uh, that float above the society uh, without deep roots of accountability, without that bond of citizenship, consciousness and expectation, uh, and uh, with generally massive uh, corruption. Uh, so this is one of several distortions. Uh, there are economic distortions as well in terms of um, uh, the structure of the economy uh, and the uh, proneness to inflation and to variations in income over time. But I think the political distortion 
of swollen states uh, that lack accountability is perhaps the most decisive for democracy. Let's turn now to the United Nations uh, Human Development Index and try to understand what it is and how it varies uh, from other measures of development. Uh, it's a, a component of three measures. The first one is life expectancy at birth. That gives us some sense of public health conditions in the country. Uh, so how long can uh, the average person expect to live given prevailing health conditions uh, at the moment of birth? Uh, the second uh, measure is a measure of education. Uh, and this is an average of two different items. One is the mean years of schooling of all the adults who are over 25 years of age. So if you count how many years of schooling every person over 25 has had, you take the mean of that. The second measure is given the prevailing rate of school attainment, how long can um, uh, children of school age expect to uh, be in school? How many years of schooling looking forward can we predict that they'll have on average? So we average those two to get um, years of schooling on average for the country. And the third measure is uh, gross national income in terms of purchasing power parity dollars. What the Human Development Index does is standardize each of these three measures uh, on a range from zero to 100, with zero being the lowest country, 100 being the highest country. So you capture uh, the variation of all the others, and then average all three of these scales to get an overall score from zero to one for every country in the world. And we find here uh, that um, uh, oil countries do not rank as highly in the Human Development Index as they do in money income. Per, uh, uh, per capita GDP or per capita gross national income. There's a gap there, and it's very powerful. Uh, and it suggests that um, maybe gross national income or any measure of per capita income in dollar terms is exaggerating the real level of development. We can look at the evidence from the 2011 Human Development Index to uh, get some substantive documentation of what I've just said. If you look here at the top four countries in human development, three uh, long-standing advanced industrial democracies, Norway, the U.S., and Germany, one more recent entrant, to the ranks of advanced industrial countries, but now in terms of the Human Development Index, uh, Korea ranks 15th uh, in the world in its level of human development. And you can see for each of these four advanced industrial democracies, their rank on dollar income, gross national income per capita, is lower by six to 12 ranking points uh, than their rank on the Human Development Index. By contrast, if we look at Singapore, it ranks 26th in Human Development Index, or if you eliminate Hon uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is not a country, its rank would be 25. But in terms of all the rankings, it's 26. But in gross national income per capita, it ranks fourth. That's a gap favoring its per capita income ranking of 22 points. And that's what you find with all of the oil-rich countries. They rank much better in per capita income than they do on the Human Development Index. And look to the right-hand column at that negative gap in terms of human development of 27 ranking points uh, for the United Arab Emirates, 25 for Brunei, 36 for gutter. It ranks first in the world in per capita income, but 37th on the Human Development Index. Kuwait ranks sixth in the world 
uh, in per capita income, 63rd on the Human Development Index. And take one of the most perverse oil-rich countries in the world, uh, one of the most corrupt and decadent, uh, badly governed countries in the world, Equatorial Guinea. It's 45th in per capita income and the richest uh, African country in per capita income, but ranks 136th in the world in the bottom half in terms of human development, a gap of 91 uh, ranks between the two scales. What's this telling us? What's it telling, uh, telling us is that the oil income is not being distributed well among the population. It's not being spent effectively to generate the public goods that would give the level of health and education one would expect from a country that has so much income in per capita terms. So very substantial inequality on concentration of wealth at the top and very considerable perversity in the generation of public goods, inadequacy in education, health, and related spending because of corruption and inequality. So this helps us to understand why oil-rich countries uh, are not yet democracies. First of all, you have the problem of severed citizenship relationships that I talked about before. But second of all, you have the problem of inequality and the lack of spending on public goods generating uh, not the same extent and type uh, of middle class that we find uh, in the advanced industrial countries of the world whose income derives from many different sectors of industry and services and not oil or mineral mining.